answer them. I may or may not have an answer, but I'll try. I will also be here the rest of the day and through most of tomorrow if somebody would like to have some discussions in outside and the venue today. So please feel free. I'll do the best to answer them. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a PhD. I'm a citrus nurseryman. And my job is to produce orange trees, and that's what I do. Um, I've sat in the same seat that you're sitting in now. I had a group of scientists stand up in front of me in my industry and say, we have HLB, and our industry said, okay, we're going to make changes. And the immediate change our industry said we would make is we would stop tree movement in the entire state. And if you ever could imagine a group of people getting mad, all the nurserymen in the room turn red and say, you're trying to put me out of business, I can't afford to do this. And it started off in a very adversarial context in Florida. And I encourage you not to do that. A citrus nurseryman, a citrus grower, a packer, a processor, research institutions are all symbiotic relationships. And we all need each other. And starting in an adversarial position doesn't help matters any. Now, that said, that's Florida. You heard from Dr. Graham this morning and his descriptions about the disease and some of what we've done in Florida. You heard from Mr. McCarthy this morning. And I want to start also by saying you're not Florida, you're not California, you're Texas. And you have to build a rule here that suits your state. So I encourage you to take bits and pieces from everybody's presentation today and then put them together in a format that fits your industry. You don't have to copy what we've done. But I, I'm going to go through some basics of what all citrus industries have done. And then from that point, I think, take some of those basics and move forward with a rule that, that fits your industry, that fits your state, and will work for you. OK? See if I can move forward here. i got to figure out here, aha. Primary job of a citrus nursery, in my opinion, produce a quality pathogen-free tree. I use the word pathogen because there are lots of things that affect orange trees. In my presentation, I will flip-flop back and forth a little bit between pathogens and diseases. Uh, that's just the way I look at some of these at times. So if you see one versus the other, I'm, I'm referring to something that really affects, you know, the quality of the tree. How are we going to do it? That's the big question. Every nurseryman in Texas has started asking himself that question. Every grower in Texas has started asking himself that question. Uh, again, I think you work forward, you work through, and you move forward with a program that fits your industry and your state. Don't do what the rest of us have done. But you have the opportunity at this point to write a rule, to put a rule in place, to come up with guidelines, programs, whatever suits Texas. And I don't have the answers for that. I think it's your industry's job to come up with the answers. I will say, though, if you don't come up with the answers, somebody else will. It eventually will happen. APHIS, USDA, at some point will come in and say, all right, you have not done anything, and here's the rule that we're going to put you under if you want to continue to ship citrus outside of the quarantine zone or the state of Texas. And USDA will start with a little quarantine zone, and then it'll get a little bigger, and then it'll get a little bigger. And in the case of Florida, we wound up with a whole state under quarantine. It's just the way the system works. So take advantage of the opportunity you have today and move forward and create a rule that works for you. All right, they've all done things different, but every citrus growing region in the, in the world has done things very similar. All of them have a budwood foundation of some type. So these all generally start out with a committee, growers, nurserymen, and scientists working together back to that symbiotic relationship. They all come up with guidelines for budwood importation, budwood protection, and testing protocols. You must, and you are on the path. I know I spent enough time with Mark and Dr. DeGrasse in here at the center to know that you are on the path to developing this secure foundation of budwood. It's a must, because that's the first step. You must have clean plant material. And I understand that economics are always an issue. I understand that money is hard to come by. I know that everybody's thinking to themselves, how are we going to afford it? 
I don't have the answers for you, but I can tell you affording it is cheaper than not affording it, if that makes sense. So you must start with clean sources. You have to do it. If you do not, every tree you get in your industry is already infected before you start. So if there's HLB in your foundation block, you send those bud or bud wood, bud eyes, increased block trees out of your <coughs> industry, you're behind eight ball before you ever got started. There's just no way around it. So you have to protect it. Every region in the world has come up with some set of regulations. These generally include insect ex in exclusion structures. Entrances of some kind, predominantly they are double entrances to prevent insect entrance, and they have all come up with sanitation practices. Every single one. Now the sanitation practices vary a little bit from region to region. The structures vary a little bit from region to region. The entrances vary, but they are all basically the same concept. And you could write, on this sanitation practices, and I'm going to talk more about this later, you could write volumes on this right here, literally volumes. Because once you get the material in the structure, you now have to keep it clean when it's in there for a multitude of things. Budwood foundations, key, sound horticultural production practices to allow for visual inspection of diseases. Very, very important in my opinion. Do not make assumptions that what you see on your tree is zinc deficiency, magnesium deficiency, or some other nutrient deficiency. Because as you saw in Dr. Grant's presentation, sometimes some of the beginning expressions with some of the diseases is nutrient deficiency. You cannot make assumptions here. They must be horticulturally correct, grown correctly. Your soil pH must be right. Your nutrient program must be right. Your temperatures must be held in accord. So when you go in there, or you, you as a nurseryman, or you as a grower go to a nurseryman, he orders propagation material, you have to have a level of confidence that it's correct. They must all have routine testing. I know that Dr. DeGrasse is you know, going to mark or going down the path. I know you've been doing routine testing. I'm not suggesting that you're not, but it is a key component. It does have a cost associated with it, but it is a cost your industry somehow has to figure out how to come up with. Well-built structures to prevent insect and disease incursions. The reason for this is, is there's a lag time. HLB is there's a lag time between infection and visual symptoms with HLB. You have a silica incursion on March the 1st, you're liable to be at the end of the year on a young tree, on a young tree, on a young tree. On a young tree before visual symptoms incur. If that young tree is producing, I'll just pick a random number, it's been harvested three times with three or four hundred eyes per harvest, it's gone to three or four or five different nurseries, and those in turn, those bud eyes were used to make increased flocks, that three or four hundred can turn into thousands of trees. In my opinion, you must establish rigorous sanitation practices for all personnel and equipment. I know this is a little low, I'm sorry for that. There is no such thing as too clean. In your Budwood Foundation, there is no such thing as too clean. I'll get to that in a little bit why. <coughs> Limit access to only necessary personnel. These are not show places. These are not places that you let people around the world come and tour. These are not places that you invite your buddy from across the street, hey, come look at what we do. That's not what these are for. There should be limits on who goes in and who goes out. In our situation in Florida, I think we have a very limited number. If you come to visit me in Florida and you ask to see my Bud Wood house, I'll let you look through the screen. I'm supposed to communicate. I'm going to let you. I'm down there. The risks are too high. This is our Chiefling. You heard Dr. Graham earlier talk about Chiefling. This is our Budwood facility. This is a couple years old now, but it was a nice aerial picture I stuck up there. It's a lot of facility, but it's not as big as one might think. Yes, it has a cost. This thing is isolated. It's in Chiefland. The only way I know how to describe Chiefland would be if you could think of Gainesville. You know, home to the Gator Nation. I don't know if you 
Yeah. Like A&M or something here recently. I don't know remember. And uh, it's, it's way, way out west of Gainesville. So this thing is 30 miles, 40 miles from commercial citrus. It's very isolated. Why isolation? It goes back to that worst case scenario. What if we have a hurricane? What if we have a breach in the structure? What if something happens? I, I, I can come up with any doom and gloom scenario. The point is, in our state where we are, we chose isolation as one of the key components for part of our sanitation practices because they must have routine maintenance. They have to be worked on. Screen does not last forever. Roof material does not last forever. The only roof material that you could afford, that you, excuse me, not that you could afford, that you could have on a roof is glass. But the investment is pretty high. And I think in our case, the investment outweighs the benefit. Picture of it inside. I think this is important as you guys move forward with your production facilities. This thing was completely built and sanitized for a piece of plant material to move into it. We did not want to be moving plant material into building structure. I'm not trying to be negative. I understand that you put structure over plants in Texas. I think it was the appropriate decision. I'm not saying it wasn't. But as you move forward in the construction of your foundation, that is not what you want to do. You did the structure you did out of as a necessity, as an interim measure because of the disease, and I applaud you for it. But as you move forward, I think completely built, completely sanitized, completely clean in advance. Why is packaging tree important? Because one tree can infect your entire industry in 90 days. That's all it takes is one tree. So one increased block tree, 100, cut 100 eyes three times, 9,000 eyes per year. If you cut three years, you not produce 27,000 eyes and 100 trees per acre. That's 270 acres infected in 90 days pretty significant percentage, I think. Now just let, let it be three or four increased block trees and three or four nurseries. And now you're up to a thousand acres pretty fast. That's if these are insect vector diseases, C V C H L B, uh trustees virus is still on that list for me and others, it's a catastrophic event because if you already have the vector, you just give them the opportunity to move the disease. What kinds of pathogens? Now, I have up here insect vectored and mechanical vectored. They are not exclusive. Some are both or the other. I'm not trying to suggest that they only move this way, but this is how I view them. These guys right here, as far as I'm concerned, are right up here at the top of the list as worse as you can get. Dreaming, HLV, one long being, stubborn disease, prestige virus, citrus variegated chlorosis, leprosis. There are others. It's not an exclusive list. Mechanical vector, wind, rain, people, machinery, other things that are also draft transmissible. Again, citrus canker, citrus blacktop, phytophthora scab, alternary, and greasy spot. If somebody's sitting out here saying, why in the world did he put alter alternary and greasy spot on this list? Because it costs money to fix it. It costs money to control it. It's a cost per acre. So if you can take the cost per acre that you're using right now for greasy spot alternary or scab possibly, and just think about what it would be if you went to the top of the list. How many of you run up, this is a rhetorical question, how many of you are running a sprayer up and down every middle every 30 days? If you want to go down this path, or if you are forced to go down this path, from what I'm trying to say, this could be where you're headed. It's what we're doing in Florida today. Our best growers now are spending an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money trying to control these diseases. Dr. Graham showed you pictures of HLB, small fruit, blotchy model, tree loss, again, more blotchy model. I'm not going to, because of time issues, I think we're running late, I won't stay on that too long. But there are others, Trestesia virus, stubborn disease, CVC, leprosis. Citrus canker, citrus black spot, Phytophthora, scab. There are others. 
Very important for the Budwood program as well. Cristocortis, cirrhosis, Catalase virus, Hexacortis, Cacaxia, and a whole list of viroids. All part of keeping a clean Budwood program. There are established testing protocols for these. I'm not a scientist, that's not my realm, but I do know that you know every industry in the world works on those. I know that you are here in Texas as well. My point with this is HLB is not the only reason to consider screening in your nursery system and working on your budget program. In your decisions and in your discussions, in your industry, I encourage you to consider the others. I'm not trying to preach doom and gloom. I know it sounds bad. I don't mean it that way. Don't get me wrong. Our industries, industries around the world are still thriving even with diseases. It costs more and we're different. It's a different hurdle, but citrus isn't gonna go away. It's not gonna disappear. It's gonna be different. Our processes are gonna be different. Our costs are gonna be different, but citrus production is not gonna change, not gonna go away. It's gonna change and we're gonna adapt, but it's not gonna leave us. People are not gonna stop eating grapefruit. People are not gonna stop drinking orange juice. But in the decision process, think about these others as we move forward. Here's what we do in Florida. Here's our source tree testing. This is our basic protocol. Um, I saw some references to this earlier, but in 2007, you can see we did 3,000 HLB tests. In 2010, we did 8,558. 2007, we did 3,000 prestigivirus. In 2010, we did 8,821. And these are also the cirrhosis, catarrhine, leaf blocks, and the viroids complex. 44,164 tests. This is just source trees in Florida. That's it. Just trees used to propagate them. All right, back to the similarities again. I talked a little bit about the foundation block. Let's talk about nursery production regulations. How to produce a pathogen free tree. I think I heard somebody say something very similar to this. I'm going to repeat it. Start clean, stay clean. That's why your foundation is so important to you. You have to have it. You must have pathogen free seed. You must be able to have seed for rootstock production. And you must protect trees in the nursery from pathogen infection. Now, somebody in your industry has probably said to you somewhere, well, why can't I just spray them on? Good but you're not going to stop the disease that way. I heard a scientist about two years ago say, if you think controlling an insect vector, if it's an insect vector virus is an easy task, why have we not stopped malaria in 100 years? 100 years, we've known about malaria, an insect vector disease by a mosquito. We have millions and millions and millions of dollars invested nationwide to control mosquitoes we still have malaria So chemicals aren't the only answer. They are one answer. Rootstock seed must be disease free. If you grow your own, I'm not sure here in Texas if you grow your own seed here or if you buy seed here, but you must establish some sound sanitation practices for seed extraction. Poor sanitation can lead, and I know you don't have citrus canker, I'm not suggesting that you do, but it can lead to canker infections. It can also lead to phytophthora infections, if it's not clean. If you purchase your seed, work with a reputable person. There are several around the country um, that you can work with to buy seed. Structures. This is one I took in California a couple years ago, but Basically, they're all the same. A roof, keep the trees dry from fungal and bacterial diseases. Double entrances, exclusion, uh, insect screen on the sides, some kind of air curtain when doors open to prevent the insects from entering the structure. Because this is your enemy. You're looking at trying to keep out a psyllid that's, you know, a millimeter wide and three millimeters long. 
He works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He does not take a holiday. He does not stop eating on Thanksgiving. He does not rest on Friday afternoon. He doesn't stop and get a beer on the way home from work. He doesn't do it. He's a constant after food source and they love young flush and nurseries are full of young flush. Absolutely full of it. And there's so much young flush there and there's so much young flush growing so fast the chemicals are not the answer to complete exclusion of psyllids in my opinion. But they're the same the world around. That's the point of this picture. This is Citrograph, Sassagrass Nursery, Sao Paulo, Brazil. But you don't see any differences. Roofs, screen, double entrances. See the little blue thing right here in the little pan? That's a hand washing station and a foot bath. That's part of their sanitation practices. Everybody washes hands going in, everybody steps in the foot bath. There's another one right there. And there's one at every entrance to this entire earth. The Brazilians, in the face of all their diseases, CDC, black spot, leprosis, greening, have the cleanest, maybe the cleanest, but at least one of the two cleanest citrus nurseries, citrus nursery production systems in the world or none. And there's a lot of discussion here, and I'll talk some more about this in a little bit, but how do we grow trees and structures? We can have a lot of discussion about that. The Brazilians at this point are claiming, and I think they're telling me the truth, nine months from seed to sale. Nine months from when they plant a seed, they have a sellable tree. Now somebody's saying you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it. I'm not so sure. You talk about folks that have spent an awful lot of money on nutrition and soil type and containers and structures. We're talking about an industry here with these guys that have a 0 .3, 0 .3 phytophthora infection in the state of Sao Paulo in 2008 or 9. .3 out of, I don't know how many trees they produced, 20 million, some huge number. Maybe not a high, but huge, huge. Much more than we do in the United States. I apologize for the two big ugly guys in the middle. <laughs> you know, the point here is this is in Mexico. This is Kumex Citrus Nursery in Veracruz, Mexico. Notice the double entrance. Notice the white sink and the hand washing station on the double entrance. Now they don't have a rule. There's no rule, they don't have to do this here. But in this particular case, these folks are moving forward, forward with it. These folks produce 900,000 trees a year, by the way. Pretty big nursery, quite surprising to me. Sanitation practices. Basic hand washing. I think the hand washing to me in my nursery is very, very high on the list. You cannot come see me without washing your hands about three times before you get the one. It's huge, huge for bacterial fungal diseases. Foot bath. In my place and in almost every place in Florida, every place in Brazil, and many, many places around the world, there are foot baths that you will walk through. They will have copper sulfate or some equivalent material in them. You will step in them and you will sanitize your feet. And many of them, including mine, you will walk through a misting station. And in my case, I'll tell you how bad I am. I won't let you wear a wristwatch or a cell phone case or a piece of leather. You take them off, you're going. Because anything that's grimy can hold bacterial disease. Clean clothes, clean shoes exclude all sources of non-tested plant material. And I take that all sources very, very literally. I bring very, very little plant nursery into my, or citrus plant material into my nursery. Very, very little. The only sources that come in to me is I essentially bring in labor, stakes, container, soil, seed. Nutrient materials, of course, fertigation, but I don't actually think he's in the structure. Where we're at. Clean tools between uses. Tools is everything. Butting knives, sharpening stones, clippers, tape guns, whichever tools you use, regularly clean them. Keep your soil on concrete, keep it dry, don't pile it up on the ground. Now if you buy bag soil, 
I think that's fine. You can work the bag soil. My goal here is so that your soil is not in touch with the ground. That's going to cause you a phytophthora infection. For us in Florida and in Sao Paulo and other parts of the world, you don't work in the grove in the morning and go in the nursery in the afternoon. That's an absolute no-no. We don't do it. The risks are too high for us. Now, we have citrus canker. You do not but I encourage you to think through being able to implement additional rules in the future in case you have something similar of this type. I hope you don't. I do not wish it on you for anything. But if you're going to spend the money on a structure, a little extra planning won't hurt anything. This is one of the entrances going into uh, one of the nurseries in Brazil here. Uh, hand washing station, foot bath. Notice the very long trough. So there is no way that you can get through the trough. That's the design. You can't get through it without foot sanitation. You can't do it. And then I didn't show pictures of that, but in, in Brazil, most nurseries will make you change clothes. There's one nursery I know of in Sao Paulo that will require you to get a shower before you can enter the nursery. That's how serious some people take sanitation. Almost all, all of them require change clothes. Soil pile, yeah, and here's just an example. I kind of hate tracking in the way, but I didn't really have a good picture of it. Here's an example. Concrete, sides up, tarpaulin on the soil to keep the pie top out. Just as a footnote, some people are very interested in air cooling. And if you'll notice, every one of those is about a 36-inch fan. Pretty, pretty excessive number of fans. All right, so. Frustrated. I don't want the government to tell me what to do. I don't want to change. I've been in this a long time. <clears throat> when we were going through the rules and trying to make the rules of the committee that Dr. Graham was talking about earlier, there was a guy who stood up in the back and said, I've been growing orange trees for 50 years and I don't see any reason to change now and I've survived this and I've survived that, yada, yada, yada. He's one of the big believers in, in screening in today because. Today in Florida, it doesn't take long to understand what the effects of HLV can be if left untreated and unworked. So we got to get past the frustration. We got to get past the aggravation. We got to get our notions wrapped around what are we going to do, how we're going to do it. Be proactive. So in Florida, we had a committee, as Dr. Graham discussed. We worked as a group. We came up with a Florida citrus nursery stock program. It is part of Rule 5B62. Here is the web address on here. If anybody wants to go look it up, it's online. Uh, it's a rather extensive protocol. Uh, all of it doesn't necessarily pertain to what you might want to do. Took effect December 26, 2006. There's 27 sections. I'm not going to cover all 27 sections. It just I don't think you'd enjoy it, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't enjoy it either. But I'm going to go over a few. Purpose. It is intended that there shall be no propagation of citrus nursery stock except as provided in this chapter. And it shall be unlawful to plant citrus nursery stock in Florida unless that citrus nursery stock has been propagated pursuant to this chapter. No, in our case, means none. It's all inclusive. There are no exceptions in Florida. That's how we handle it. I understand that this is Texas. It's not Florida. I understand your state's bigger. Your industry's different. But this is what we do. Requirements for structures. I've had an awful lot of people ask me, well, where is it in the rule that says this is what you got to have for a structure? Well, here it is. A. <laughs> An approved structure must have enclosed sides, tops built to exclude insects with positive pressure double door entries. Sides and roof shall at a minimum exclude melon agents. That's the rule. How you get there is an individual choice. The rule isn't necessarily written to say this is what you got to have. It's got to be so wide or so long or so high or whatever. It wasn't intended to do that. It was intended to provide a system to produce disease trees without disease how you as an individual nurseryman or grower got there was your choice. 
And if you come to Florida and look, and I know some of you have, I encourage all of you to travel and look some more as you move forward with your decision making. And you'll find every one of them in Florida is a little different. I don't think there's any two alike. None. The integrity of the structure is comprised, if, I'm sorry, if the integrity of the structure is comprised or breached, the citrus nursery stock shall be subject to immediate quarantine action and will not be eligible for certification until treated as prescribed by the department and released from quarantine. Pest monitoring tools such as sticky traps and other protective devices, detection devices for plant feeding insects should be used by the nursery and may be used by the department to evaluate the integrity of the structure. That's a very fancy way of saying we're gonna risk assess you if you get a disease. And the risk assessment varies for disease, location, etc. But in Florida, if you have a disease and you are found positive with a cylinder canker or HLB, now we haven't had HLB in the nursery, so we don't really know what the quarantine process will be, but we have had canker in nurseries and we had that one civet. We had one nursery where a roof came off and a storm of in a plastic roof, and we put the roof back on, we didn't apply any chemicals, and we had one civet. And he went through 90 days of quarantine. And that's generally what your quarantine in Florida would be, would be 90 days, three months. That's kind of how we handle it. Now, 90 days doesn't sound too bad, unless that 90 days, in our case, is March the 1st. And if you're, if you're trying to ship trees through April, May, June, you know, so if 50% of your shipping schedule is in that 90 days, you're, you're in deep doo-doo really quick, I'll tell you because cash flow is always an issue in a citrus nursery. Dooryard citrus nursery stock maintained in containers larger than seven inches in diameter may be kept in an enclosed greenhouse designed to deter civets. The difference being is because of our dooryard industry, we still require them to screen in, but we didn't require the same types of structures. So they have a little more leeway to get because the cost per square foot or the number of acres really is so high. Citrus nurseries must be at a minimum of one mile away from commercial citrus. One mile. Now, our industry wanted all citrus nurseries to isolate from citrus in the beginning. And our growers really wanted us to move. And it's one of these situations where a grower saying, well, you've got to relocate. Well, it's pretty difficult to tell a guy he's got to uproot his wife. You know, he plays football on the high school team. His wife's been working at a phone company, you know, for 20 years. It's a lot to ask somebody. We really got into some very heated discussions and arguments. Hard things got said, and people said things they wish they had to said later, you can imagine. So, the compromise was this. Citrus nurseries located on sites prior to April 26 will not be required to comply with the one mile setback from commercial citrus groves while continuously operating at April 1st, 06 location. So in other words, everybody who's an established nursery it, that one that day was allowed to stay where they were at. Anybody knew? Anybody wanting to build a new facility now had to meet the one mile minimum. Now that said, there are several citrus nurseries that were existing that have still gone and made that with the one mile minimum. There are several of us. And we get into some kind of some rules here that, you know, I put them up here because I want you guys to think about them. The site should have adequate parking outside the facility. Somebody's going to say, well, what does that mean? What it means is, is you're restricted to parking in a certain spot. You can't drive all the way around the whole not. It's not a place to go to. It's not a parking lot to drive around. The site should incorporate an area for deliveries and shipments. In other words, have a plan. You know, again, some way to get stuff in and out. The site should have an adequate water supply without using surface water for irrigation. I know here in South Texas that that is probably a bigger hurdle than it is in Florida. We have a very large groundwater aquifer. It's readily available to us. 
So sources and groundwater for us are easy. But the reason this is in here goes back to that slide about phycophora and some other things we've been talking about. Surface water can be highly infected with phycophora. Um, there are ways to treat that, of course. I think here in South Texas, you have to work through what works for your industry. The point here being is don't be pumping on phycophora. Site should incorporate natural artificial wind breaks to reduce wind blow rate. That goes back to the bacterial and fungal site. Disease issues, we do not want wind blowing in and out of nurseries. We also want to protect those structures from storm events. Keep in mind, you know, that we in Florida have a lot of storms, a lot of wind events, hurricanes, tropical depression, even bad storms. So we want those wind breaks to be there for multiple reasons. And it, it's the right decision, to be honest, for us. Citrus nursery night must be fenced and all entrances must be secured. The idea here is don't be letting people come in and out, don't give people access. It's not a 